You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Got kids, a full-time job, an insanely busy schedule, and wondering, is this what you really signed up for? I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Well Show. Palak and Nidhi Jamdar thought they had really made it when they successfully climbed the corporate ladder in their prospective jobs. But when they had children, they started to question if getting up early, dragging the kids to daycare, working all day, coming home exhausted, getting the kids fed and to bed, just to start all over again the next day was really what they wanted. So they put their heads together and came up with a different plan that includes a $10 million real estate portfolio and a lot more real wealth. They're here to tell us how they did it. Palak and Nidhi, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. We're excited. And how long have you been investing in real estate? So we started back in 2014, 2015, I believe. Um, yeah. And it was. And little... I went full time in 2016, yeah. early 2016. Okay. Wow. So you started in 2014 and went, how did, how did you do that in a, such a short period of time? So that's a, <laughs> uh, that's a story, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. I was a, a mechanical engineer working in corporate. I worked for 17 years. He was in corporate in finance and strategy and we had kids mm -hmm. and we waited till our late thirties to have kids because, you know, we thought stability financially, you know, climbing up the ladder before you do all that is great. But then when we had kids, we realized we never saw them. I, mm -hmm. you know, the higher up we climbed, there was no time for them. And so 2014, we had our daughter and then 2016, um, had our son and I did I didn't want to go back to work because it was just so difficult to keep up with everything and every every morning it was uh we were always we would talk and we would be like okay who's gonna take one for the team today because you know that either the nanny was sick or something wasn't one of the kids was sick or something wasn't right and so we would always be like all right who's doing who's gonna take one for the team this morning <laughs> and so um 2016 I said, I really want to quit my job. It's, you know, I had worked really hard to get there, but it just wasn't the life that I thought I was building. It, it was just so much stress. Um, so at that point, we had a few rental properties that we had purchased, um, just rent ready, 25% down, 20% down um, rentals. And that offset my income a little bit, the cash flow. Um, there was still a deficit. Couldn't, you know, I was making six figures plus. So there was still a deficit. And so what, what we said was, hey, I'm going to quit my job. There's still a little bit of a deficit. But the next few years, I'm going to work on building something that would replicate my income. So that's kind of how, <laughs> how everything played out. Okay. No, I think that's it. And, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, I think it was almost at one point when even with a six figure income, we were paying so much in other fee costs with, with, with nannies and with daycares and all that. We, when you take all that out, we really weren't keeping that much money anyway. <laughs> so and it taxes. wasn't that difficult of a decision. Yeah. I think it, It's a really light bulb moment, isn't it? When you realize yeah. Wow, if you just deducted some of these expenses and the tax savings you would get from investing in real estate, it, it makes sense to just stay home or have one yeah. person stay home. Uh, so how uh, did were you able to get the uh, real estate professional status and get the, the write-offs against Nidhi's uh, salary? Yes, yes. So that was one of the biggest advantages of uh, quitting my job, not just being able to work on real estate full-time, but also all the tax benefits that come with being a full-time investor. So with the tax savings you get from being a real estate professional, would you say you were kind of at the same place as if you were working? Yeah. At one point I, I distinctly remember telling him, I was like, you know, when I deduct all of this stuff from my salary and then add the taxes and all of that, I'm basically working for $1,500 a month. I'm working 
you know, and, and, you know, I had climbed up the corporate ladder. So these jobs are not easy. You have a lot of pressure yeah. to perform and deliver and I was managing a team of people. So I had to be on site full time. And it's not, then it, it's not a 40 hour a week job. And I was like, wow, I'm doing all this work for 1500 a month and not being able to see my kids and being stressed out, not getting enough sleep, not being able to take care of my health for 1500 a month. That's what I had come down to. <laughs> Too often people don't um, calculate the numbers. What, what was that like when you did add it up and, and realize that you were really almost working for nothing? It's, I mean, to be honest, I felt extremely, extremely resentful. Mm -hmm. to, you know, having done all of this work, waited to have kids. And, and then you, you find out that that's, that's all you worked that hard for. <laughs> yeah. But you could yeah. certainly make $1,500 uh, working at home doing just about anything, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but yeah. it's, it, it's around that, in that range, right? Like it, it doesn't come yeah. out to be that much with all of the expenses associated with keeping these uh, jobs. Nidhi, what was your response when she said she wanted to quit her job? You know, I, I was, at first I was like, are we sure we want to do this? <laughs> and partly because she has always been very driven in her career. And, you know, uh, and I was like, there was a, it was a big sacrifice, especially at that point, not knowing where, you know, where she would go, what we would do. Uh, I think we, we both agreed that it's the right thing to do from a, just from our peace of mind and um, it, all the stress that we had in our lives, it was just catching up to us. And we're like, okay, maybe that is a, maybe it'll give us a breather. And she can always go back to work if, you know, if she felt in a year or two that she, that she really missed it. But very quickly that we weren't sure then turned into you know what, this is the opportunity. We already had three or four rentals at the time. And like, you know what, you're driven, you're ambitious. Let's, let's, you, what if you focused on building the real estate portfolio? Because the good thing with real estate is that you can tune it, you can turn it up and down the level of effort based on how you want to do it, right? If you want to grow fast, you can put in more work. If you want to uh, take it, take up a, a couple of months off, you can do that. And that's what we loved about real estate is the flexibility. So we, we basically pretty quickly doubled down on real estate. Yeah. And it was a tough, tough choice. And I think the, it, it was quite a defining moment for a relationship too, because I didn't think he was going to back me up. <laughs> because, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because I had, you know, it, it, it's what we do is such a big part of who we are and so much self-worth associated with our professions. And so I wasn't 100% sure when I pitched that idea, I didn't think he was going to go for it. <laughs> and then it, it, it was a defining moment. And, you know, we, we really, I mean, for me, it was uh, amazing to see that he would back me up if I was going to take a back, big risk like that, a lifestyle changes, life-changing risks, right? Yeah, so for anyone yeah. listening who would love to be able to have that conversation with your spouse, get the information first. Speak to a CPA, ideally someone who specializes in real estate. We have a whole lot of them at realwealth.com. What you'd want to present to your partner is the information, right? To, to be able to show if I quit my job and I focused on real estate and was able to become a real estate professional, I could get all these deductions that can apply to your earned income. And it won't really make that big a difference in the family. Plus I can do this and increase the income. So it, that's a scary conversation unless you come with the data and the information. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, just to add to that, like one thing that we started doing as soon as we figured that out was we would put together like a, um, a plan, almost like a vision board for both of us individually, but also one for us as a couple together, because it's quite often we go through life as uh, in relationships and in, in marriages, not having a a long-term vision of where you want to go, whether it's right. wealth, whether it's how you want to live your life. And I think just thinking that far ahead helps you come on the same page of, you know, how you want to achieve it. Oh, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. We just hosted a couples retreat at our home. We had six couples that 
they're very, they were all very successful. Uh, they had their own goals, but they didn't together as a family, as a couple. That is a missing piece a lot of times. And if you're together in the boat, right? The boat of life, but you're kind of paddling in different directions. You're not, yes. you just end up spinning your wheels, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to spin around. Got to know where you're going together as a family. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So one thing I bet you realized is that those skills that you had worked so hard on, um, you know, managing, scaling, uh, leadership, all of that, when, when applied to your own business and that business in this case was lead with, you know, was uh, real estate, but wow, can you get further than oh my God. building it for using all those skills on someone else's b- business, right? Absolutely. What a great point. It's You don't realize that, right? When yeah. you're in corporate, you're just trying to climb the ladder and impress your boss and, you know, <laughs> but you have no idea how much you've actually learned. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people will tell you um, if you're starting to, you're starting your investing journey or any kind of entrepreneurship, they'll be like, oh yeah, but you don't, you know, you don't have those skills. You may not be able to do it. You've always been a nine to five. But there's so many transferable skills that you learn, as you said, with building systems, building processes, building teams, treating it like a business. And that's one of the quick things we we realized pretty quickly was that uh, a lot of people that we first started investing in real estate, we saw that a lot of them are mom and pop investors and they purchase like one property every two or three years. And we're like, wait, yeah, but if you really applied, if you really understood commercial financing, if you really applied building systems and process and teams, you could scale this a lot faster. Yeah. And that's where you're able to do that. A lot of people don't realize, as you said, you already have those skills. You just need to apply it to your own business. Yeah. Instead of impressing your boss, impress right. your spouse, <laughs> impress each other, impress your kids. Yeah, absolutely. Put all that effort and energy into something where you really get the benefit. So 2016, you had two young children, you quit your job. How? What did you do to scale your real estate business to get to a point where you could replace your former income? Yeah, so we we had already seen the power of real estate by then. So we had about three or four rent ready rentals, and we thought, oh, there's a cash flow coming in. This is a great passive business. But one constraint that kept coming up was how do we find capital to buy more properties? Because every time we bought a property, we had to come up with fifty, sixty thousand dollars to put a down mm-hmm. payment. And uh, that was a lot to come up with multiple times a year. So we discovered the Burr strategy was fairly new at the time where you essentially buy a distressed property, you rehab it to force the appreciation, you rent it out and refinance it and keep the property as opposed to selling it. So you, you're really building wealth over time. And that seemed very attractive to us because that removed the capital constraint because you're really reusing that same capital from that deal because you're forcing the appreciation in a short period of time, pulling the capital out. And we really made that strategy our mission, right? Yeah. We learned everything about it. We And there's many different ways to implement the birth strategy, right? Uh, but we kind of altered it and, and tweaked it where we could truly scale it. Like really commercial financing was a big component to it. You know, building systems and process and teams was huge that we that we made it really our own. Where where did you invest? So most of our investments are in Philadelphia, actually, because that's where we lived. And, uh, you know, it's Philly is, is still a good market because it's appreciated quite a bit. It, it still has challenges. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel there's so many places that you could that you could invest. There is no no such thing as a perfect market, but it's it's really how you, um, you know, you apply it to a different market. Absolutely. We've actually seen a lot of our real wealth members do the same thing, but in a situation where they're both working, they don't have the time to to buy property at a discount, which has been hard. It's been hard over the past few years to even find that you've got so much competition. Uh, but you know, it takes a lot to be able to find that property that's mm-hmm. at a discount, renovate it, and make sure you stay under costs and all that. If you're doing it from out of state, you live in California, hard to do that in California, so you've got to do it somewhere else. To do it We've seen... Time. The strategy where people just buy in an area where there's growth anticipated and they do the same strategy. It's just different than the Burr model. You're, you're buying an asset that is in an area that's growing and then you can do the same thing in a, in a year or two, maybe, maybe two or three, refi, take your cash out and keep building. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. instead of uh, forcing the property to appreciate right away by renovating it, you wait a year or two and wait for it to appreciate a little bit. And if you're investing in an appreciating market, it's a little bit easier than the 
average 3% appreciation. Yeah, yeah it's not going to happen as quickly in the Midwest or, you know. Right, <laughs> right, yes. right. Exactly. Yeah, you got to know your market. Yeah. And, and, and also... Um, just knowing that then you're just finding more sources of capital, which is fine. But again, yeah, there's so many ways to tweak the strategy and make it your own. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, we started investing in Philadelphia because we, at the time we lived in Philadelphia and we saw a lot of development and we had a few rent ready rentals, but very quickly we started running the business like out of state investors and so I find it really interesting how, you know, the what did they say? Necessity is the mother of invention. And, <laughs> yes. and mm-hmm. we had to, you know, we had a toddler and a newborn and mm. I was operations, right? Full time. Uh, we would work together on real estate nights and weekends. But then during the day, I was trying to figure it all out. And I'm like, every time I would be like, okay, how can I do this from my house? How do I do this without leaving my home? Um, and in the beginning, like our contractor has worn, uh, our son in a baby carrier when we scoped out properties, like we did, every- yeah. <laughs> you know, scoping out neighborhoods, putting kids in the car seat during nap time, driving around to see under, get an understanding of the neighborhoods. And very quickly, I was like, you know what? I could do Google street view to scope out this neighborhood instead of, having to go there physically. I could look on citydata.com to get a good feel for this neighborhood as opposed to having to drive around, right? I I could do a video call with my contractor as opposed to being physically there. So very, very quickly, we started operating like out-of-state investors. And your contractor can send you regular photos and videos of what they're... Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. City data, let's talk about that. That is such a great resource. What what tools do you use on city data? So uh, it's it's mainly to scope out sort of new cities and new neighborhoods if you're going to invest in. So, uh, you know, I always say when you're picking a neighborhood or a city to invest in, you want to make sure that the population is increasing. You want to make sure that there's diversity of employers so that uh, if it's just, it's not a one horse town, like if there's one company and that goes under, then it affects the economy. Um, so, you know, just having sure, making sure there's different companies there um, and also just looking at crime and things like that. So all this, uh, there's uh, city data is one one example, which has, you can literally look up any city and it'll give you all this amazing data and that you can, as an investor, then you can say, okay, I'm making decisions based on what's actually happened in the city and what the tra- trajectory is um, before you decide to invest. Okay. Well, what would you say are the big lessons you've learned over the almost 10 years that you've been doing this? Oh my God. <laughs> so many, <laughs> so many right? So many. We're still learning. Yeah. 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 Quite a few, but I, I yeah, go ahead. I was I was just gonna say I think I think a big one for me um, was uh, was coming overcoming limiting beliefs, and I think it stops so many people from investing. Uh, you know, so many people that we talk to that are new investors, they um, they read a lot of books, they listen to a lot of podcasts, but then they still fail to take action. And I think a lot of that comes down to fear, and a lot of that comes down to um, you know, not knowing that you're headed in the right direction. And I think just knowing and trusting yourself and uh, picking a strategy, learning it really, really well, and then trusting it and taking that leap of faith. I think that's that's a hard part for a lot of people. And we always talk about mindset in, in investing and mindset in growing your assets, which um, I think is just so important. I wish, and people talk more about tactics and strategy when they're first starting out. But if people realize that mindset is such a big component of that, that I think that that'll just um, help you grow faster. Oh, that is, that is it. That's it. I, when I started investing, I was listening to CDs and tape, like I think back that it was CDs um, to, to change my mindset, you know, like met deep meditations to imagine myself having all these things that I wanted. And I, cause you have to retrain your subconscious and it's hard to yeah. do. Your subconscious has given you what you currently have. And so you have to change years and years of what you believed and what you thought was possible. Uh, if you want to change what you have, it literally happens from within. Yes. And 
Uh, I can't, I cannot emphasize that enough. So how did you change your, your mindset? Uh, I think it, for, for us, it was really, uh, we did, practically we did a couple of things. One is affirmations that really helped us. So every yes. morning we would say, and we still do this. And we started doing this with our kids a couple of years back where every morning we'll be in the car, all four of us, and we'll be like, all right, what is, let's do affirmations. And then we'll say, I'm going to have a great day today. I'm going to uh, accomplish this, this, and this. And um, I'm going to, uh, even if I um, fail at something that I do, I'm going to uh, learn something from it and be positive. And for our kids do the same thing. They're like, I'm going to have a great day. I'm going to learn. I'm going to make new friends. And that's just starting your day off in a positive way. It just changes how you react to different things that you that happen uh, in the day. So affirmations is, is a big one for Absolutely. us. For me, it's, you know, really it, it affirmations and having that vision, but it, it's, I've stumbled a lot before things have really stuck in my head. I feel like, you know, you always think it's easier for other people. I think that's just a given, but <laughs> I always feel like it's never been a straight line. It's always been like a, a process where it's ups and downs. And then finally, one day you wake up and you say, okay, this time this is sticking. The mindset shift that I wanted to make has <laughs> stuck. And so I feel like, and then especially when there's a lot going on, maybe the kids are sick or, you know, you yeah. got a bunch of projects going on at the same time and you're stressed or tired. Um, I feel like it's so easy to revert back to the old mindset because that's, you know, our, our neuro, what, a, what do they call it? The neuro pathways are not formed they're, yet. They're formed. deeply formed on yes, the, uh, exactly, the original exactly. ones. The new ones are fresh and young. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. The, Neural power. Oh, you know, I've always looked at it like a video game where you get the first level down, you think you're a pro and all of a sudden you're on the next level and you have no <laughs> idea what you're doing. And you're like, wait, why isn't this working anymore? It's like, you have to learn new skills. I still constantly have to readjust to where I am in life. It's, it's like a, like, I don't know how to say it. You have to adjust to the vibration of where you are yes. and it does take time, but the, it helps a lot to have a partner remind you like rich will say, Yes. Is that really, you know, if I, if something comes out of my mouth, it's negative. It's like, is that what you really want to create? Because we do believe that what we speak has enormous power, has enormous power. And when you have someone to remind you of like, really, is that, you know, if you, if you're saying uh, things are so hard right now, really, is that, is that what you want to speak out into the universe and how, you oh, know, that's, that. that's so true. And, you know, sometimes we'll catch our kids even saying something um, that is, may not be uh, maybe a little bit negative about themselves It'd be like, you know what? careful because thoughts becomes words and words become beliefs and beliefs will become your future. And so it's like important to those things matter. Like I wish you we were yeah. taught this earlier. <laughs> I know it matters unbelievably. I love what you do with your kids, starting them out. We, we have a game we play every year before school where I'll take each child out to lunch. I mean, they're grown up now, but, and yeah. we would play a game where we would imagine it was a year later and we were having Ooh. lunch and we would, we would say, Oh, how was your year? How was seventh grade? Tell me all about it. I want to know everything. How did you do in yeah. school? Who were your friends? But it hadn't happened yet, but they had to talk about it as if it did and be excited. Love and it. it's powerful. <laughs> it is. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we are out of time. Any final thoughts for our audience here? Many of whom are like really high in the video game and some just starting out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, you know, it's just keep going no matter where you are. And as you said, Kathy, like every level that you cross, you're going to face new challenges. And um, it's not that it gets easier, but you just get better at handling it, right? And as you grow, the stakes only get higher. And so it's just, um, you know, keep going, no, keep your eye on the prize and keep dreaming, dreaming big. I think um, I'll just tell Paula, cause like we, we were first generation immigrants and we we're like, we didn't come this far only to come this far. Like we have to go a lot farther. So. And I would say to add to that, if you find discomfort, sit with it. So in the beginning, I'm very tactical. I'm an engineer. It's all about like numbers and steps and, you know, what's the quick fix to this. But if you ever run into discomfort, if you ever run into challenges, um, listen, listen to your body and sit with it. What's making you cringe? What's making you uncomfortable? And there is something to be worked on inside us to overcome that challenge and to get over discomfort 
as opposed to finding that tactical solution. Mm, yeah, I love that. I sometimes I'll just scan my body, like where is this stress, and I'll, I'll literally ask my body because the body is brilliant. So oh, yeah. yeah, and and those of us who are in our heads a lot, you know, certainly engineers, that's not where the solutions are. It is within <laughs> the body. It's in the heart, and it's so hard to shift. But if you do just listen to your heartbeat or listen, listen to your body. Where is that feeling? Where is that pain? Where's that stress, anxiety, whatever, and talk to it. Like, what is it you're trying to tell me? What is it you need? What do you want? Yeah. And we get through it. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Well, I did not know this is the direction the show would go, but I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, very quickly, if you'll just tell us where, you know, where you are today in terms of your portfolio and what's next for you. Yeah. So, so right now our Portfolio is around $10 million, which is a combination of single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, 10, 15 unit buildings. Uh, and our goal is to keep growing that and really um, add as much value as we can, just because, you know, we thought when we first started out, we uh, just listening to other people who are way ahead in the game helped us and hope we can provide value for others as well going forward. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you for having us. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you would like some hand-holding or just some support and how you can also get off that treadmill and learn more about creating real wealth in your life, that is what we are here for. We have investment counselors at Real Wealth that will walk you through the process. Believe me, thousands of people have done it, and so can you. You can get those details at realwealthshow.com. It's free to join, and there are hundreds of webinars and free resources for you to help you on your way. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. We'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.